I'm Dr. Barry, licensed psychologist, and today we're going to talk about motivation and why people are not lazy. Have you ever felt like you just couldn't get motivated to do something, even if it's really important or even if it's something that you are interested in? You are not alone. Motivation is a complex and multifaceted concept that we are going to break down today. If you don't get anything else from today's video, please get this. People are not lazy. In fact, the idea that people are inherently lazy is a myth that has been debunked by science. When we feel unmotivated, it's not because we lack willpower or discipline. It's actually because our brains are wired to conserve energy and avoid pain. When we perceive a task as difficult, unpleasant, or risky, our brains activate the amygdala, which triggers our fight or flight response that can make us anxious, stressed, or overwhelmed. This is why it's so hard to get motivated when we're facing a challenge or deadline. Our brains are telling us that it's safer and easier to stay in our comfort zone and avoid taking action. However, this does not mean that we're doomed to be passive and unproductive. We can hack our motivation by understanding how our brains work and using science-based strategies to overcome our resistance. The book Atomic Habits by James Clear breaks down that the issue isn't that a person is lazy or not motivated, it's that they need to develop a new process. And he gives very practical tips to do this. Here are just four tips to increase your motivation. Tip one is to break down your goal into small manageable steps. And so instead of looking at the whole big task, thinking about writing a 15 page paper, think about the title, the outline, break it down into more manageable steps that don't seem as overwhelming. Tip two is to use positive self-talk and affirmations to boost your confidence. My personal one is get her done. Like when I'm trying to get things done, when I'm feeling stuck, just to think, just get it done. And for me, this takes away the perfection or the focus on, I have to get it right. Like, no, I'm just, I just need to get it done. I just need to do the thing. And that sometimes taking some of that pressure off of yourself can help remove some of those barriers to completing the task. Tip three is to create a supportive environment that minimizes distractions and maximizes focus. And so some of the clients I work with that work from home, we talk about making sure that their workspace is clear and free of distractions. Or sometimes it might be helpful to, before I start working, maybe I need to clean off my desk. Because once you start going, all of these little things that might be more interesting or it can be really easy to do other tasks in the midst of that. And then the last tip for this section is to reward yourself for making progress and milestones. And it doesn't have to be something big. It could be something small, like between completing each task, I'm going to scroll for 10 or 15 minutes. But make sure, especially if you have ADHD, because there can be this time blindness where you lose time. You think you've only been scrolling for 10 or 15 minutes, but it's been two hours. And so you might set a timer so that you have that external reminder to get back to whatever you were doing before. Now let's dig a little deeper into the science of motivation. There are biological, psychological, and environmental factors that can impact motivation. On a biological level, it's our brain's reward system that releases dopamine and other neurotransmitters when we experience pleasure, satisfaction, or achievement. However, this reward system can easily be hijacked by external factors like addiction, stress, or negative emotions, which can impair our motivation and lead to unhealthy behaviors. And I like to give the example of social media because it can initially give you this pleasure or relaxation, but over a time, it can disrupt someone's reward system, leading to addiction if we're not being careful, if we're not being mindful of, am I you on social media to avoid stress or to avoid these other things? 
versus am I using these strategies and tools for this brief period of time to help me re-engage with my life? Or am I using it to completely disconnect all the time? Because anytime I use one thing all the time on a consistent basis, that's when an addiction or that's when it can become a problematic coping skill. On the other hand, exercise can also activate the reward system and release endorphins, improve mood, reduce stress, and boost motivation. And similarly, eating junk food can give that immediate gratification, but it can also impair the brain's ability to regulate appetite, mood, energy levels, leading to fatigue and other problems. Eating a balanced and nutritious diet, on the other hand, can nourish the body and brain and help enhance cognitive function. But often it doesn't give that immediate, so eating chocolate versus eating an apple, chocolate is probably going to give you that immediate, ooh, yay, this feels good eating, but there can be this crash later versus an apple you're not necessarily, unless you just love apples like that, it's not going to give that immediate reward, but it does help nourish your body in a way where your blood sugar isn't spiking the way that eating junk food might do. Because I'm a psychologist, I can't talk motivation without talking about a therapeutic intervention called motivational interviewing. It was developed by psychologists back in the 80s. Initially, it was used with clients that struggle with addiction, and now it's been used to help resolve ambivalence in clients when they might feel stuck or resistant to change. The core principles of motivational interviewing that I want to focus on today are empathy, acceptance, and collaboration. These emphasize the therapist's role as a supportive and non-judgmental partner and a client's journey towards change. And so if you do have someone in your life that you want for them to change something, sometimes taking this type of approach, not using this therapy intervention, but the first step has to be to have the person see that they have a problem. Because if I'm trying to motivate somebody towards change and they haven't even accepted that where they are is a problem or what's happening is a problem, they aren't going to be motivated to that step. And so it takes this incremental approach with, okay, if I'm meeting with somebody new and they don't even see their behavior as a problem, the first goal is going to be to help them see that it's an issue. And we start with empathy, reflective listening, where I'm really trying to hear things and affirming them and trying to see what their intrinsic motivation, values, and strengths are, and the barriers that are getting in the way of any change. And within this technique, instead of imposing my own agenda or advice, I really help the client clarify what their goals are and what things they're willing to do, putting the process completely in their court. And as a therapist, just supporting them along the way, because they are the ones that have to do the work. By using motivational interviewing, clients not only develop a deeper understanding of their motivations and values, but it also helps increase their confidence, self-efficacy, and create a personalized plan for sustainable change. So let's dig deeper into the different stages of change. That first stage is pre-contemplation. And within that stage, that's where the person is not even aware that there is a problem and they're resistant to change and might need a little bit of empathy, education, and feedback to increase awareness and motivation. That second stage is contemplation. This is where the client has realized, okay, there is a problem, but they might be ambivalent about change. And that's where we do more reflective listening, exploring, and ask questions to help clarify whatever those barriers are and what the client's goals are. We dig deeper into those goals. And then the next stage is preparation. In this stage, the client may need a more concrete plan and some goal setting and reinforcement to implement and maintain the change. Then there's the action stage. This is where we put that plan in motion. And then there's the maintenance stage where we provide additional support, feedback, and then relapse prevention because anytime you're making a change, you might fall back into old behaviors. And you want to do this in a non-judgmental way. So if I'm working with somebody that is developing a healthier relationship with food, if they come and tell me that they 
relapsed and fell into some old behaviors, there isn't going to be a judgment. There's going to be a discussion of, okay, so what was the plan? What happened? What worked? What didn't? Now, how can I, as a therapist, help the client determine how they get back on track? So in conclusion, one of my biggest points that I hope that people understand is that motivation is about regulating that discomfort, regulating my emotions during difficult times, under stress, and that avoidance works. And the brain wants to do that. The brain desperately wants to avoid pain. And if I change my perception of how I'm viewing, let's say it's my case notes. So I always have notes that I need to do. If I change my perception of how I'm viewing that thing, that often that can help increase my motivation to complete that task. If you have any questions about motivation or want me to dive deeper into this subject, please let me know. Make sure to like, comment, and if you have ideas about other videos, please let me know. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.